Um, I wonder what sort of strength of character it took to sign for Celtic, knowing that they were trying to stop Rangers getting 10 in a row. You mentioned earlier, you just touched on it, the 97-98 season. What, what are your memories of uh, what it meant to achieve that title victory? Were, were you winning it? Were you stopping the opposition? What was, what was the uppermost thought in your mind? Well, do you know, I wasn't, uh, you know, it sounds strange, Andy, but I wasn't super aware of the scenario because coming from Cumnock and, and you know, you know what it's like in, the, in this job? Who do you support? What school did you go to? You know, and I, I never was a great supporter of any team. I just loved watching and playing. And so I wasn't super engrossed in what was happening in Scotland at the time because I was so engrossed in what was happening, what was happening with me at Chelsea. And how the long story short, how the Celtic thing came about is because they'd offered me a, a long contract with a testimonial, and that would have taken me to 10 years. But I said to them, listen, I don't kid myself. Kerry Dixon got 4,000 at his testimonial. You know, I'm not going to get a man and a dog. By the time I pay the police, I'm going to be out of pocket. So I had some uh, negotiations over my contract, which weren't going anywhere. And 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 how it came about is the late great Tommy Burns had tried to sign me a year or two before. So Tommy had tried to sign me, but Chelsea had said no. And they'd said, well, if that ever changes, let us know. And with my contract situation running out, they alerted Celtic. Now, Tommy had gone, but Andy Ritchie was still there. Davey Hay was still there. Mm -hmm. Davey, who I've got so much time for, and Andy. But, you know, Davey was super nice to me when I got there and couldn't, couldn't, couldn't have been more helpful. But I really wasn't aware, Andy, until I stepped out, until we got off to such a bad start that the fans were saying, you know, losing the first two games of the season, Hibs away and Dunfermline at home, you guys better sort this out now. And then it just started to realise, you know, what just what this meant. Because, I, you know, I was never... I'd been to Celtic Park uh, a couple of times because my dad used to be a... <laughs> my old boy used to be a referee and a, and a linesman and he'd, 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 he'd run the line at Celtic Park and I'd been up there. Uh, but I'd never been to these grounds as a supporter and so I didn't understand what the supporter understands. But I soon did. I soon did. I just wanted to make yeah. a move anyway. I'd never, I'd never planned to go back to Scotland. In fact, I planned to spend all my career in England. But after my contract scenario and then Hullet had left me out the 97 FA Cup final, which Stevie Clark later told me, he left you out because you wouldn't sign your contract. And I thought, well, I'm not signing. I'd played in the Cup final in 94 against Man United, but I thought, I'm not signing four years for a Cup final. And so I'm glad I did because... The move to Celtic came about, and it's it, it's a great club, and we had a great time there. So things work out for a reason. You know, I did not get Celtic over the line. Henrik Larsson didn't get Celtic over the line. Alan Stubbs didn't. Matt Reaper, nobody got... That group of players got Celtic over the line. It was an unbelievable squad of players. Uh, but, you know, I was nervous because... You know, Paul McStay had just retired. I heard Paul, who I'd played with with Scotland, lovely man, great player, uh, worshipped by the Celtic fans. I was taking his number eight jersey. I was moving into the middle of the park. Celtic fans had seen me playing for Scotland as a wing back. It wasn't very exciting. Uh, I knew, listen, and I, I, I knew I, the fans were nice to me when they came, but I, I wasn't. An, I wasn't an exciting signing. I wasn't Paulo De Canio and Van Hoydonk and and that. So I knew I had to win the fans over. Everybody did, and and you know that that's that's a big it's a big weight on your shoulders. So I knew that I did. I was replacing a legend, and I had to win the fans over, and that was that was nervous. That was pressure and had to uh, win Vim Janssen over as well because I wasn't a Vim Janssen signing I was already on the books I was already in the radar before he got there I mean Henry Larson would have been a Vim Janssen signing Paul Lambert might have been at that time Darren and myself and all these guys Johnny Gill probably Stephen Mahe none of us maybe even Matt Reaper probably Matt Reaper I don't think any of us were a Janssen signing I might be wrong you know, obviously, Henrik was a nailed-on one because the fire and connection and, and they, knew, they knew there was a clause in the contract. Uh, so I had to win all these guys over. Uh, but they were great. Murdo, uh, Murdo McLeod was a big help as well. 
uh, when he was there. And, and things got off to a great start because we played, uh, who did we play? We played Parma in a friendly, pre-season friendly before the season started. And, and don't forget, the Scottish season at that point started two or three weeks before the English season. So that, so I had only just gone back to pre-season at, at uh, Chelsea, whilst the Celtic boys were three weeks in. So by the time I got to Celtic, I was miles off my fitness because of that, those reasons. And I was like, I signed on the Thursday, I think, eventually, after I did all the medicals, which was quite stringent. Uh, and then they were playing Parma on the Saturday, and I was like, at Celtic Park. And there was going to be a big crowd there, and I'm like, Jesus Christ, don't pick me. I'm not fit. Don't play me. Don't play me. Don't play I didn't want to play. Oh, I was cacking myself. I didn't want to play. Because first impressions last. And I knew I was chasing my fitness. And he freaking plays me. Jansen, I could have killed him. He names me in the team to play. And I don't know how. There was 40,000 there, I think. And I don't know how. I don't know how I managed it. But I played really well. Must have been a fluke. I played really <laughs> well. Or it was either that or Parma couldn't be asked Because Parma had a good side at the time. And I was pinging these balls all over the place. I was playing all these great passes and that. And, I, and then he took me off because I wasn't fit after about, I'm just, I'm, I'm guessing now, 60 or 70 minutes, I, I can't remember. And I got an ovation because I'd played really well and I thought, oh, thank Christ for that because it could have went the opposite way because, you know, as I say, first impressions last and I was, I, I, I didn't sleep the night before because I didn't want to make a really bad, I didn't want to go out and make an arse of it. Because when you're not fit, you you really can do that. Because if a if a really fit player can be can play badly and it happens, then a really unfit one, who's just started pre-season, can definitely play badly. And so for me, that was a huge moment that gave me an awful lot of confidence. But I but I but I still knew with the first game coming up round the corner at Hibs, I still I knew he was going to play me, but I knew I was chasing my fitness. And every day after training, Janssen would take me out onto Celtic Park because we used to train at Barrafield uh, at the time, uh, which I loved. I know they've got this new big facility at Lennox Town, but I loved the old shitty Barrafield because we used to drive down there. And, uh, you know, we used to jump in somebody's car, three or four of us would jump in the car, we'd drive down, try and avoid getting a speeding ticket because uh, they'd always be waiting for us, the police, because they knew we were coming. And uh, train at Barrafield, get in the cars, go back to Celtic Park, have a shower. And then Vim used to take me back out in the afternoon onto the pitch and I used to do box-to-box running strides to work on my fitness before the season started. And he knew I was chasing my fitness, so we'd work on that. But I knew going into the first couple of games that I wasn't 100% fit. Uh, and that's, you know, that's what happened. I, I didn't, uh, we didn't play well against uh, Hibs away, uh, live on Sky, and in Fermland at home, uh, we lost both games. We didn't play well. I played terrible. And the crowd were howling for blood. Howling for blood. Particularly after the Dunfermline game, when they beat us 2-1 at home, with all these new signings, with a new manager who they wanted to kill. And I remember going over to the old jungle side, uh, in about 85, 85th minute or whatever it was to grab the ball and take a quick throw in and someday at least one person shouted hey Budley why don't you fuck off back to Chelsea quickly and I was like do you know what that sounds like a great idea because we were getting hammered at the time and so that was a terrible start. I might be wrong, but I think if we'd lost the next league game, so that would have been three straight league games, I think I might be wrong, but I think I can remember somebody saying it would have been the worst league start in Celtic's history. And clearly with 10 in a row on the line that season, <laughs> that wasn't ideal. So it was a hit. <laughs> it was a baptism of fire, put it that way. And that, that just piled the pressure on even more. Did you come across Fergus McCann in any of your dealings? Yeah. I mean, he really changed everything there. And did you have any dealings yeah. with him? Yeah. Well, he came when when there was when we had a bonus row at the end of the ninety seven ninety eight season that some supporters <laughs> for some reason think I started. I mean, it's like just another Chinese whispers. It's absolutely nonsense. 
He came down to see the boys when we realised the Rangers guys were getting about four times the bonus we were getting. We're like, ah, I've just won the league. You know, and right, right, Jock, get Fergus down here now. So the wee man come down with a hat on. Henrik was there. And all the boys were there. Tommy Boyd, who was the captain. We were all there saying, listen, listen, we, 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 you know, we want parity. You know, just beating these guys. We were, no, you know, take it or you'll leave it. And off he went with the bonnet back upstairs. There's only, there's only ever one winner. Apart from that, yeah. didn't, didn't really have see him much. He came to the games, you'd see him floating about, but but he let he let Jansen and Murdo and that get on with it back in back in the day. So no, he he was a businessman uh, and a very good businessman. And so he he did what he did and, and the rest of us did what we had to do.